Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan. Uh, my uh, project was to look at blood glucose control um, for our cardiac surgery patients here at the in Regina General. Um, jumping in directly, skipping over the left of the background here, um, we were focusing on trying to maintain euglycemia for our cardiac surgery patients. Uh, we know from the available evidence that um, if patients became hyperglycemic, and it increased their risk of a lot of things, including death ultimately, but also a lot of comorbidities and a few other issues went along with things. So our aim was to try and maintain this glycemia for at least 48 hours post-op post-cardiac surgery. Um, driving in through this and looking at, of course, there's many layers and many things that uh, delve into this. And, uh, you know, as a, as a East Coast kid that I am, um, learning things like uh, something called a fish phone could be useful for something more than fertilizer was, was lovely. Uh, and driving these things forward to then build up some of the ideas we had for some of the changes we go about. Um, I actually came into this a little bit earlier, and as, as uh, Stephanie mentioned earlier, we were in a PDSA cycle without realizing it early on. Uh, if you go back to look, we started our baseline data collection back actually in December 2017, um, going through essentially three PDSA cycles to describe. The first one was uh, post-operative surgery. We decided we would continue to run the insulin infusions that is normally kept on while the patient intubated, even when they're extubated, to help maintain better glycemic control. That was the intent. Um, PDSA number two, which started in September 2019, which was to bring in, <clears throat> excuse me, which was to bring in um, a decision support tool for the transition of this IV infusion over to subcutaneous basal bolus, uh, and then finally, just before the pandemic hit, we changed the availability of insulin in the critical care area to try and uh, increase that or modify that transition. So initially, our, our, our background, or sorry, our baseline data, uh, each one of those colored lines um, is an individual patient. So you can see there's A, uh, lots of variation, and B, re lots and lots of data to play with. And that red solid line uh, is that 10 millimoles uh, of blood glucose in the serum that we were trying to target to keep everyone below. Uh, more simply, after we did a little bit of uh, with some support from the data scientists doing some uh, modeling to go with it, um, again, uh, on the vertical axis, you see blood glucose. On the uh, horizontal axis, you'll see time post-procedure, so post-OR. Uh, and then the gray thin lines in the background are individual patients. Uh, that red solid line, again, is about 10 millimoles of blood glucose we are trying to keep below. You see a baseline, there, there's quite a bit of variability. Um, and on average, the, the red line there, or sorry, the blue line uh, there, patients were still getting up uh, above uh, 10 millimoles early on within the first day, but actually in the second day they were doing, uh, things seem to be dropping down below that line quite well. Um, after we brought in, we decided to continue to run the infusion for the first, uh, until 8 a.m. the next morning, we can see that actually in the first day we were managing to uh, get the, on average, the blood glucose down below that 10. As you can see with the background there, there's quite a bit of variation still. And in the second day, that's when we were having patients sort of drift up above. Um, PDFA cycle two, which was again to bring in a decision support tool um, to try and uh, get the blood glucose in better control. In the second day, you can see still quite a bit of variation, but on average, patients were below that line. Finally, in our third iteration, where we then changed the availability of some of the insulin in critical care um, to try and bring that down. Again, still not quite there. There's still quite a bit of variation, but for the most part, we're getting 68% of our patients to maintain their blood glucose below the 10 million moles that we're aiming for. So next steps, we're in the midst of a, of a surge, as everyone is aware. And so one thing we want to look at is some of the use and some utilization of that decision support tool. Um, in feedback and talking directly with clinicians, including myself. Sometimes that tool suggests that we use large doses of insulin and that scares us, scares me too. Um, and so our question is how we're doing, how we're maintaining uh, and utilizing the tool that's available to us. And if it's not there, is it a concern with the tool itself or is it concerned with um, collecting and showing that it is actually a safe option that we are underdosing and we're actually uh, not putting our patients at risk by using the high dose that it might be suggesting. Um, the next thing that we're also considering is what the glucose pre-op was, how their control, patient's control was before they went to the OR. Uh, and then finally, there's some question about the uh, testing frequency post-update two. Um, key learning for me was 
the, the, the target markers of choice. And as you saw, there was a massive data. So talking to data science, maybe we need to think about what markers we're using and how often we're sampling. Uh, I personally got hung up on some of the smaller details and uh, thankfully, that slows down a little bit, but thankfully my team was help, able to help support and sort of spread that out a little bit. Um, and as well, I, I, I think the biggest thing for me was to try and engage that team a little bit sooner and get everyone in a room a little bit sooner to ask some of those questions. Um, I have lots of people to thank, the data scientists, the uh, Ange Payne and Meredith Ferris, who did a lot of the unfreezing for me, which was great, uh, as well as the, 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 my sponsor, my coach, and, and the rest 